This is Metal Mike, and in this episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast, we talk to a guitar legend, solo artist, and from Nitro fame, Michael Angelo Badio. We talk about what he's up to today, and we hear some classic stories about Nitro from the past. And stay tuned for after the episode, we'll reveal my list for the Kiss My Ass tribute albums from 1989, and we'll reveal yours also. Check it out. Michael, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you doing tonight, brother? Oh, I feel great. Awesome. So you are on the Speed Kills Tour 2020. How's that going? Uh, it's it's uh, fantastic. We've done, uh, it's a 28-city tour in about 31 days, I think, 32. We're on a string of uh, 21 shows in a row in 21 different cities. And uh, we're in Oklahoma City today. And, and uh, we have, uh, this will be, uh, the, we have seven more shows left starting, you know, tonight would be the seven. So we're 74, 75% done. It's been amazing. Great. So are you playing all instrumental tracks on this tour? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then what we do is uh, we have a VIP master class. I've never done that before. You know, it's not just a meet and greet. It's like we only can reserve uh, up to 10 slots because, you know, it's just too much. There's too much information, uh, you know, to keep it any bigger, but it's been fantastic. I've seen a lot of really great guitar players on the tour, and I love it. So for these classes, they actually bring their guitar with them, or, or no? Yeah, yeah, they can. Uh, you know, uh, pretty much I'd say, you know, 90-plus percent of the people have brought, brought their guitars, yeah. And I, I watch them play, and, you know, I discuss, you know, we just talk about, you know, they like to hear some of my stories, you know, about my career, but a lot of it's just really, uh, you know, how to, you know, uh, how to play better, you know, they want to want tips and advice. That's awesome. So how about new music? Do you have any new music coming on the horizon? Yeah, I am signed to a label called Rat Pack Records that has Metal Church and Michael Sweet and KXM with George Lynch and Ray Lucier from Corn and, you know, George obviously from Dokken and Lynch Mob. But um, yeah, my album comes out at the beginning of April, it's called More Machine Than Man. And I have uh, special guest appearances by Chris Adler from uh, that played in Lamb of God at Megadeth on drums and Victor Wooten, a uh, five-time Grammy Award winner on bass. And it's really a great record. I'm really proud of it. Wow, that sounds pretty wicked. Uh, one thing, when I, when I hear about master classes, I think back to, it was probably the early 90s, I went to a guitar clinic that you were at and you had, I think you had just the dual guitar at that point, and you played rhythm on one hand, lead on the other, and I gotta tell you, it's something I'll never forget, I was blown away, and I mean, how the hell do you split yourself in half like that to do something like that? Well, I, I'm a piano player, you know, I started playing piano, so it came kind of naturally, and I'm left-handed, and I play a right-handed guitar, so playing left-handed wasn't that hard for me to do it's, it was my natural way to play so but yeah i enjoyed doing it uh, i still play the double and still do things like that it's a lot more developed solo than what i played you know it's always different but uh yeah it's fun i still do it it's the last song of the night nice so uh speaking of guitar who are some of your uh guitar heroes who's your top three favorite guitarists you know i make a joke and say me myself and i uh, <laughs> i don't really have I don't really have one favorite. There's just too many good ones. And, and a lot of, you know, my quote heroes outside of like, uh, you know, like from the Eddie Van Halen generation on, I know I've met pretty much everybody and, and not, not to sound arrogant. I don't mean it like that, but, uh, I, I don't really have any, any heroes, so to speak. You know, I have people that I really admire and I love, but there's so many, I can't even say it. So, if there's people out there that haven't listened to some of your solo instrumental music, I mean, I really think they should. And I went back before the interview and kind of refreshed my memory on a lot of this stuff. And it's very melodic, a lot of it. Uh, it's sophisticated, a lot of feeling. So I think when somebody thinks back to kind of like the shredding that went on in Nitro, uh, the, your solo stuff's a whole different ball game. What do you want to say about that? Well, it is, and you know, I Nitro wasn't the first major label band I was signed in. Uh, in my early twenties, I was signed to Atlantic Records with a band called Howlin', and we were all from Chicago. But we, I'm, I'm a Chicagoan, you know, I was born in Chicago, but we were all we were four Midwestern 
young guys and we met in California and the music was very much kind of in that Chicago style, like cheap trick. I mean, that was kind of that Midwestern sound. And, um, and I was the songwriter on every song with, with the singer. And so I come from a, a song oriented background, you know, it just happened to be with nitro. I had the technique to play super fast. So I was just a product of the times. The label wanted me to play extremely fast, and I had the ability to do it, but that's not really the way I approached music, and, and it sure wasn't the way I was brought up. So when I was had a chance to do my, my own music, um, you know, I, I like to write with melodies, and but, you know, I, I never sacrificed tearing it up. You know, that's part of it, too. So, you know, I had both elements. And, you know, one thing I don't know if you get enough credit for is, I mean, you're a riff guy. I mean, you've got killer riffs on, on all your material. So, you know, of course, you're, you're a very fast player. You know, you're, you can be a shredder, but I think you write great riffs as well. Well, yeah, you know, the thing about Nitro was it, it was a blessing and a curse sometimes because I got a label that all I do is play fast um, because of that, because the label... The president of the label literally told me that he goes, Michael, I want you to overplay all the time. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> That's what he wanted me to do on Nitro. And so, you know, and there's a lot of people that, you know, I mean, just pundits, you know, I mean, people who like to, you know, say stuff online, oh, Michael can't write or he can't do this. Now, granted, I have a really good fan base, so, you know, a lot of people don't think that, but it was, I think I got, uh, it was, because I had that kind of technique and I could do it, people didn't want to listen to the writing, but I think I wouldn't have a career now if that's all I did. You know, because I, you know, I, I love to write music and I'm still here and I'm still signed and, you know, I've done a lot of records, so can't complain. I was reading something about you that you got your start actually as a session player. So it sounds like we probably heard commercials back in the day that had you playing guitar on them. Would that be right? A lot of them. Yeah, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken, I mean, Pizza Hut, United <laughs> Airlines, United Way, all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, I was on a lot. You know, see, Chicago used to be, they call them, they called them jingles, uh, the TV commercial music. And it used to be the jingle soundtrack uh, 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 city of the United States. And, you know, when you think back in the day, Oprah Winfrey, where was she at? Chicago. Phil Donahue, Chicago. Jenny Jones, Chicago. Jerry Springer, Chicago. All the daytime TV was in Chicago, not Hollywood. And um, when a lot of the TV commercial music was done in Chicago, and I was one of the top session players, I can read music really good, but really what it was more than reading music is to interpret what somebody wanted you know i mean you could see a c chord like written on a page but they didn't want you to play c they wanted you to play something creative and that's what i was good at well maybe some night you can bust out a metal version of uh of uh, pizza hut or something man <laughs> yeah well you know we just did a, uh for the super bowl i did a metal version of the super bowl thing and uh, I had a friend of mine in uh, Florida. We had a couple days off because we didn't have a show. It's the only break in this tour during the Super Bowl. And because, you know, it's hard to book a show on a on, a, on the Super Bowl night. And so we just took a few days off and uh, we were in, in Orlando, Florida. But, um, yeah, I'd love to do it. You know, I'd love to do that. That was a great part of my life. And, you know, I was literally, uh, it paid to, for college for me. Um, you know, I was a, I would, uh, I did a lot of session work over the years in my early 20s and when I graduated school and, and then, uh, then right after that I moved to L.A. Now, you have had to have some offers to join some big bands because it sounds like you could jump into any band and, and play anything. I mean, you ever do you get offers to join bands? Yeah, I did. And I, I don't want to say which ones. Sure. But, you know, I, I've had a different kind of career because... I, you know, I, I mean, I, I play thousands of shows. Even now, I can I can do one man concerts. I, you know, I just in the last couple of months, I played with Vinnie Appice, uh, um, you know, his brother Carmine, uh, Rudy Sarzo. Uh, last year, I played with Chris Jericho from Fozzie nice. uh, at a big show. I do a lot of things with a lot of artists, but I like doing it on my own terms. I would, I would, you know, I, I had an offer to do, I'm a, I'm a good public speaker. And, you know, when I do these like guitar seminars and things, and, you know, I mean, they fly, you know, I've got 1.2 million miles at night. It, it sounds kind of crazy for people that are 
rock bands out there, but I get to play anything that I want. And, and I just get to do a lot more shows than like an average guitar player that's in one specific band. And so I've really had a very career and I love it. You know, it's always different. You ever thought about maybe forming your own band, almost similar to like a Ingve Rising Force where you have vocals, some instrumental? You ever thought about doing that? Or? Well, well, you know what? I, the last thing I did was I got with Chris Adler and then, uh, we we uh, had uh, a bass player. He's not as well known, but he played with Fear Factory, and we toured India and Nepal and stuff like that. So what I like to do is get together with main musicians, and those are the kind of tours I like to do. And you know, but this will be my, I think it's sixteenth. I've got to look exactly if you add up all the albums, but it, it's at least my fifteenth solo record that I've released. So it's a lot of music, and right now I'm just enjoying. Uh, I do so many different projects. I'm just really into it. You know, just doing a lot of different things. Well, as you know, my podcast are, is called the 80s Glam Metal Cast. So we do have to talk a little bit, hopefully, about OFR. I think people look back at that album and still love it to death. I mean, what are your thoughts on it, looking back on it? Well, I think our music was great. I mean, I think Jim and I wrote, I mean, the songs, Double Trouble, yeah. or Shot Heard, Around the World, the really catchy songs. We had great songs. What we didn't have is the label one, you know, we had a 19 year old lead singer. Jim was 20 years old when the album came out. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a young band. Um, he could sing anything. The label really told us if Michael, if you overplay all the time and Jim, you can sing higher than an octave higher than Jeff Tate in Queens, right? I mean, the guy was singing a fourth and a fifth higher than Jeff Tate's highest note. I mean, the song shot heard around the world. He hit a high soprano C. Now we're talking, if you look at the first string of the guitar, <laughs> I mean, we're talking literally, you know, let's see, 15, 17, we're talking the 20th fret wow. on the high E. He could sing that high. It's a high soprano C, a woman C, like in a, in a, you know, in a, in opera. And so I think that sometime, and they wanted the product, the production really abrasive. They, you know, it's kind of like Metallica's Injustice for All, yeah. where yeah. the music is really great, but the production, it's a certain way. Some people like it, some people hate it. But we were purposely, uh, we were purposely mixed and mastered like that, and we were featured. And I think if you heard our demos, we had backed up. Jim still sang really high. I still I still played fast, but it was way more in the context of of what I grew up with, which you know you had a melody to start with. But I think the songs have stood the test of time. They're really good songs, and I, I think regardless of. And the, and the performances were real. It was analog tape. You can't fake that stuff. You can't punch in in the middle of a track, you know. It was real. It's not like today where you can piece something together. Or I mean, we really did it. And, and it was just fun. I loved that time. I, I really loved that era and, and the time. Machine Gun Eddie is just an epic masterpiece. Were you the mastermind behind all those riff changes? Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, Jim was good at coming up with riffs. But... Um, I had the song Freight Train and Long Way From Home written. They were, they were, I didn't have lyrics or melody. In fact, Freight Train, I came up with this funny thing. I went, believe in yourself. And Jim goes, that's really stupid, man. <laughs> and then in about two minutes later, he starts singing Freight Train. So, but I had a lot of that music written. And then it, it was almost like, I remember reading this thing about Elton John and Bernie Toppa where Elton John would get a set of lyrics and, and 10 minutes later he'd have a, have a song that became a hit. Jim was the same way. He just heard what I did and like he would just write and it'd be done. We, we were really, we wrote a lot of songs together and it came very easy to both of us because he had a lot of ideas and he could just hear, uh, he was really good at writing choruses. You know, I give him a lot of credit for that. I mean, he really knew what a good, I mean, like a freight train, like a freight train coming. It was, that was him. I had all the riffs. I was the riff meister, but he was, like we had that song Machine Gun Eddie. I had all the riffs, and all of a sudden he goes, Machine Gun Eddie. I mean, he came up with that. It was great. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, though, there's a thought that I have about it, is, is people can say, oh, you know, Nitro was over the top with the shredding and the screaming, but I think that's the charm of the band. It's like when somebody says uh, loudness has an accent, you know? 
I like it. It makes them different. That's why I like Loudness or, or Scorpions. You know what I mean? They have a different sound that makes them unique. And I think at the end of the day, even if it was forced or, or you guys, they pushed you to kind of go crazy, that was the charm of the album. Well, and not only that, but it was real. You know, see, I think, you know, it was, it was see, like Vinnie Vince Innovation. I love Vinnie Vince right. Innovation. I mean, we had Bobby Rock. Um, and Vinnie Vince was great. It was, I mean... What you heard on OFR was something that was within us. That was what we were really doing, and, and uh, we could do it. And I, I remember when we were on tour, I, I'm doing this right now on tour. I, a lot of people are into like uh, simulated amps and a lot of effects and everything in a computer. I'm touring right now the way I did a nitro. One amp, a tube amp, a guitar, and an overdrive pedal. I played very, very simple and in your face back then. It was real. And and like when we played Freight Train, that was one of our slower songs on tour. I remember thinking to myself when we would warm up with that song, because we used to click track live to, to keep everything the exact same tempo of the record. I started to think to myself, this is like medium tempo, and it's so fast. But but I think that's the charm of it. You, you know, it was like a coach telling us, okay, you can play fast, and we want you to play fast. You know, it's kind of like telling, like, LeBron James or a Michael Jordan, I want you to dunk it all the time. You know, <laughs> like slam dunk, and, and you can do it and make it spectacular. So, But I enjoyed it, you know, and, and the, the people loved it. You know, we, we sold out virtually every show, and our album hit the charts. It did really well. I really dig the fusion of glam and thrash. I feel like there's thrashy riffs and then there's glammy vocals. Or there's, I just, I like that hybrid uh, sound that you guys had. Well, thanks, because you know Jim, you know he had a lot of different voices, and we had a, we are we had two kinds of writing. We were we were either going to kill you and fighting mad, and, and you know, <laughs> or, or or we liked you. <laughs> you know, <next laughs> day, you know, it was either talking about girls or talking about you know, because Jim was a. Uh, you know, he was a, a he is a black belt in Gracie Jiu Jitsu, and, and so back then he was this ultimate pretty boy, but he was a, an extremely trained fighter. I mean, seriously trained. He he was like he's a death machine, and he was a death machine back then, and he's uh, even more now. And, and I mean, he's a trained fighter, and he's a serious black belt. You, it's very be very difficult, even three on one to to get him. I mean, he, he's so tough, and his kids are like that, too. Um, you know, they're trained since they were little kids. But um, it was, you know, it, again, the thing about Nitro, we were way over the top. But we actually, one of the reviews, you know, we got some bad reviews because people, you know, there's always a critic out there that doesn't like what you do. But one of them said the real true thing. He goes, you know, whatever you say about Nitro, he goes, they're the real deal. And we were. We were the real deal. That's the thing. I'm, I can still play Freight Train even today. In fact, I do it in, in a lot of the shows. Let's talk about image uh, of that era because when you look at the image that's on the album, you know the it's, it's, it's hair is really huge, right? And then I can remember you guys were in an interview with like Adam Curry on MTV, and it's a lot toned down. So was what was happening? Was the image changing? Did the label want you to look a certain way on the album? What are your thoughts on like image at that period? Well, well, see, it was OFR out out and righteous. That album cover, I mean, that picture has been used all over the planet. Right. I mean, it's become our, you know, our album photos, are, it's an iconic metal photo. See, you have to understand the Nitro mentality. We weren't high. We were, I mean, we didn't do drugs. See, it even says, drugs are for dumb apps. Don't be a dumb <laughs> app. And, and, I mean, we did not do drugs. It, I, I, I still don't, I don't like it. You know, I don't, I don't smoke, I don't smoke pot, I don't do anything. Um, you know, I drink beer and wine occasionally. And sometimes it's safer to drink the beer depending where you're at, you know, in the world. So, but um, with the image, if you look at that, see, we didn't, we didn't sing that. We didn't want high vocals. We wanted the highest. We didn't want fast guitar. We wanted the fastest. Jim's hair was not big. It was the biggest. <laughs> we didn't wear heavy metal studs. That was an 80-pound outfit that Jim wore with 2,000 studs, heavy metal. That, and, and see, and then what we did live is we didn't really like going up on stage like that. We were more, we, because we had all those thrash riffs. We, our idea was to do the record cover. It was the most extreme metal photograph that the biggest hair 
the most metal, you know, the, the heaviest metal, literally, the biggest hair, literally, four guitars, not two. Um, everything about it was over the top, but then when we played live, we looked completely like a thrash band because that's kind of where our roots were. You know, we played a lot of fast songs, and, and um, so and we could we could move around better, you know, instead of with all the makeup on and all that. But we were it was just off our. We just did it to freak people out. They didn't know what to expect. In fact, a lot of the uh, we would get interviewed and, and uh, they would show two pictures of us, and they said, "Which one is the real Nitro?" And the the answer was both. That's what we were. We would just, it was shock value. You know, we, we just, it was the opposite. It was kind of, it wasn't that the label did anything. We just said, you know, we're looking like that, but we want to go on stage looking a certain way. And, and that was the thrash way. So when you get to 91 and you guys do uh, Nitro 2, uh, what was the mindset there? Because to me, that album doesn't seem as extreme as the first. Was that the goal? Well, I produced the first record and, and, uh, you know, they said to play high and to play fast, but I produced it. Jim produced the second one, and uh, Jim's vision of what Nitro was started to change a lot. Um, you know, he wanted a safe record, and I I didn't agree with that. Um, you know, we wrote actually 18 or 19 songs, but we, a band like Nitro shouldn't have three ballads on an album, right. and, and, and uh, which we did. And, and so, but, you know, ha having said that, it's it is what it is, and uh, but that's not my vision of that's more Jim's vision of Nitro, uh, because the you know we'd already been established, and and we you know I mean uh, I just thought it was uh, you know looking back at, it wasn't the record I would have personally done, but but I stand by it. I mean he he produced he actually said that he wanted me to sound more like Warren. I had to play live in the studio, rhythm and lead. If you listen to a lot of the album, there's no rhythm guitar behind the lead guitar because I played it one take, just oh, wow. like live in this, like I'd play in concert. And I said, okay, if that's what you want, I'm going to do it. And I did it. <laughs> so I was up to the challenge. It was a challenge for me. But then, you know, the band broke up after that, partly because of the grunge era. Right. Um, you know, we were a Hollywood hair metal band, and they wouldn't, MTV stopped playing videos of Hollywood hair metal. Not just us, but Warrant, Molly Crew, Skid Row, everybody. You know, they, they went more towards, you know, Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and, and that route. Yeah, I mean, that we this, this probably comes up on every podcast that I do. I mean, it's a tough era for most bands. If, if you guys would have done a heavier album, you still probably wouldn't have had much of a chance because of that trend change. It would not have mattered at all what right. we did. See, that's the, the you know, there. if you look at music, I mean, I'm a music historian. You know, I, I love music. It's my degree. Um, but there was a timeline. It, sometimes in music, things just, turn on a dime they go 180 degrees um you know i don't i don't know all the past but you know for example when elvis presley comes out shakes the world uh, all of a sudden it's all different the beatles come out all of a sudden everything in the past is, is so radically different from you know they're so different and what happened with grunge it was so different from it, it was like everything stopped it just it turned the corner with that and it's almost like youtube um, when that came in, uh, you know, people say Napster and all that changed uh, music. I, I, yeah, it, it affected it, but CD sales and everything were still selling huge. I mean, I know Mark Tremonti from Creed and Ultra Bridge really well. Um, he played on two of my solo albums. He was still selling 7 million albums, you know, after Napster, you know, with Creed. So it's not about that, but there are certain timelines. It didn't matter if we did Son of OFR or whatever we did, grunge, killed LA hair metal it was over MTV had enough power that was it there was nothing we could have done and so you know I'm proud of Nitro 2 it was a different record but it's really good and and then you know you look at like when YouTube came out it was really the end of CDs YouTube I mean my 18 year old nephew YouTube is television for him there are timelines in, in life and music and entertainment and those are two of them I really believe that so I know a few years back, you guys tried to resurrect Nitro. Uh, it didn't work out. Do you think you'll ever try to do something with Jim again in the future? And do you ever foresee Jim doing music uh, in the future? You know, I don't know. Jim and I are best friends. He's like a brother to me. We've never 
you know, we've really never had an argument in our entire life, and I can say that. I mean, he's one of the toughest guys on planet Earth, but he's he's not a sociopath. He's really cool. And he's actually a really cool guy. And But I think when it comes to music, we both came to the agreement that what we did, we, we, we said what we have to say. We tried it again, and it wasn't the same. And, you know, we don't even talk about it about music anymore it's more we're just we're just friends and brothers so I, I don't know what Jim would do musically now I mean he's been really successful with business and stuff and so you know but we we tried it but it wasn't the same I mean I, it's hard to you know I still love performing and touring he loves you know his business side and it, it we, you know, we tried it and it was it, it just wasn't the same that's all I can say yeah well Michael, what do you want to say to all your fans that have been following you all these years? Well, I, I would like to say, you know, I, I really appreciate it, and I never take it for granted. And, you know, I, I have a really fantastic career, even this year. It's just going great. And, you know, I work really hard, um, you know, to, to keep things moving. And, and uh, you know, so I would just say check out the new album. It's called More Machine Than Man. It's coming out soon on Rat Pack Records. And, uh, you know, if you, if you see me playing in your city, come to the show. That's awesome, Michael. Well, hey, uh, have your people let me know all the details when the album comes out, and I'll promote it on my Twitter, and I'll always be giving shout-outs to Nitro because, to me, that was a great album. It still means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to the fans out there. Well, well thanks. You know, it meant a lot to us. Jim and I were really proud of it. And, you know, if you get anything from OFR, we we were. That, you know, whatever anybody says about that, I, I stand by the music. Because I love the songs. I mean, choruses, fighting mad. We had great choruses to all our songs. And, and we were, I mean, Jim sang that live. He did, I watched him and I heard him do it for two, three month tours. We were out on the road doing hundreds of shows. He never lost his voice. I mean, he was that good of a singer. He could really pull off. He sounded exactly live what he did in, in the studio. And, and I, I think that's one of the reasons we didn't want to revisit it. It's like, you know, it, it's, we, we, we've been there, done that. You know, we're really proud of it. Awesome. Well, hey, good luck with the tour and good luck with the new album. And thanks a lot for the conversation. Oh, thank you. It was great. Great questions. Thank you. Yep. Take care, Michael. Wow, that was an awesome interview with Michael Angelo. But now it's time to go over our lists for Kiss My Ass tribute album, Hair Metal Edition 1989. So first, we'll go over my list and then we'll talk about the list from the Twitter universe. Okay, let's start it off with Motley Crue, Detroit Rock City. I can really picture, you know, uh, it's a, one of the biggest Kiss songs, one of the biggest bands from 1989. I thought it was the perfect fit, and I could totally picture Tommy Lee jamming out those drums, and I think Vince would, would nail the vocals on that. Next up, Skid Row, War Machine. So we know that Skid Row, even with their debut, had a heavier side, could totally see Sebastian ripping out some screams and, and really kicking ass on that one. Babylon AD, Heaven's on Fire. I'm thinking about those big background vocals from their debut album. Be perfect on that song. Next up, White Snake, Sure Know Something. Now come on, tell me you can't hear the nice bluesy verses with uh, David's low voice and then him hitting in the high notes in the chorus. It would be killer. Lillian X, Got to Choose. Everybody knows I'm a huge Lillian X fan. And I gotta say, I was uh, screwing around on YouTube like I always am, and I found them doing a cover of this song live. And of course, Ron Taylor nailed it. Sounded incredible. Uh, it's gotta be on there. Then I went for Kicks, Two Timer. I don't really have much to say about that one. I just think that it would be cool. So let's just go with it. TNT, Reason to Live. A uh, huge TNT fan. I could totally picture Tony Harnell nailing this song with his type of voice and then Ronnie Leticro doing those awesome melodic leads in the solo. Rat, calling Dr. Love. What I found is that I think Rat could probably do just about any Kiss song. Um, probably because they you know, play in a similar style as Kiss and Stephen Piercy has such a distinct voice but I could totally picture him nailing calling Dr. Love. Next up we got Poison, Room Service. It's just that's the type of song that Poison would do, and I think Brett Michaels would nail that one. Wasp, God of Thunder. Big Wasp fan. Uh, I think that's a darker tune. I could picture Blackie having some of his evil laughs uh, hidden in the background, just like how we have the evil laughs of the kids on the real version, and uh, have him screaming in certain spots too. I think it'd be killer. 
then we knock it out of the park at the end. I didn't want to touch Rock and Roll Night. Uh, I just figure it's overdone. Let's have Warrant do Shout It Out Loud live with Ace Freely as a guest. So I think that would be super cool. I can picture Warrant doing that. Ace Freely was a big part of the hair metal era too with a solo band. So I thought that that would just be a nice end cap to this album. So next what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the Twitter universe list. And I'm going to have my buddy over here, CGM, he's going to read off the list. And then I'll interject a little bit and give my thoughts of why I picked these songs. All right, so everyone, all right, I'm just going to say this right up front. If I mispronounce your name or your Twitter handle, I apologize greatly. But we're going to kick things off here with Guns N' Roses, I Stole Your Love. And that was by Deuce at Shop and Parasite. Now, I'm going to be honest. I am not a huge Guns N' Roses fan. But when I saw this one, I said, you know what? I could picture Slash jamming out that intro riff. I could picture a little bit faster in the style of early Guns N' Roses. And I think Axel would really kick ass on this. So, yeah, we're going with it. And this one was by me. And honestly, I don't know much about hair metal, so I just picked a bunch of guys that we had on the podcast, their bands, and I put them on the list with some great kiss songs. So I did Britney Fox Deuce. Now, I didn't just pick this one because it's my kid. All right? This is not nepotism. Um, Basically, what I was thinking, I'm surprised that Britney Fox did not hit my radar, but when he put that one on there, I'm just picturing Dizzy Dean screaming, get up, you know, I can totally hear that, and if you've listened to my podcast with Johnny D, you'll know that the guys in the band were big Kiss fans, Michael Kelly Smith plays a lot like Ace Frehley, so this is a home run, man, we know that one, good good job, good job, son. <laughs> wow, that means a lot coming from you, Mr. Metal Mike. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on here with Dangerous Toys, and they're going to be performing Cold Gin, and that was by A Fish at A Fishel 27. Mr. Fish, yes, Dangerous Toys. I can totally hear this one. I, I, I picture this a little bit fast, kind of like the way Kiss would do it maybe in the early 80s, but uh, I don't know. These guys seem like partiers back in the day. This just, this just sounds right to me. Now, I think Bob Nash had the magic touch when he picked this one. We have Warren performing magic touch. And his Twitter handle is Bob Robert Nash. Now, everybody on Twitter knows that Bob Nash is the Kiss Authority. This album would not be proper without a pick of his. And uh, I could totally picture Janie Lane doing Magic Touch. Um, it's, just a, it's a home run. Now, next up on our list, we have Alice Cooper with Watching You. And that is from Tom Gigilotti at TC Gigilotti. So Tom, Tom is from the Shout It Out Loud cast. So he knows his Kiss stuff. Um... I think, you know, Alice Cooper, some people might question that, but you know what? Cooper, he, he doesn't have an attitude. He tribute Kiss. He opened up for Motley Crue on their final tour. He's a cool guy, and I'm telling you, you guys know, hear that Cooper voice on the verses, it'd be perfect. Great pick. All right, for our next one, I think Rat just wants a little conversation with Talk To Me, and we have Metal Mouth at Metal Mouth. Yeah, once again, I can picture Rat doing a lot of these Kiss songs. I'm sure you can too. Little conversation. Can't you hear Piercy doing his little, you know, his rasp? He'd be killer on this. So, I actually put Bon Jovi singing Shandy, but Vital Mike couldn't put me on there twice. I totally respect that. So we have Bon Jovi doing Hard Rock Woman. That is from Gonzalo Aguirre at Gonzaguire. So Bon Jovi, Hard Luck Woman, you figure 1989, Bon Jovi's at the top of his game. Good good place to have him on an album like this. And come on, toward the end, can't you picture John and Richie riffing off of each other at the end of the song, uh, like Peter does, you know, at the end? It would be killer. You know it would be. All right, so next up, we have The Crew performing I Love It Loud, and that is by Lori C at Lori C12. Lori C is a wonderful lady, let me just tell you that. Let's just get that out of the way. And Motley Crew, I Love It Loud, once again, I can picture Crew doing a lot of Kiss songs. Tommy Lee thundering on those drums. Vince's voice, I think, also would just be killer on the verses of this one. And then picture that big chorus, the way the choruses are on like the Dr. Feelgood album. Slam dunk. Next up, we have the Bullet Boys performing All Hell's Breaking Loose. Matthew David Smith put this one in at MD Smith Comics. Yeah, man, come on. You could picture Mark Torian doing the little talk rap thing. Yeah, that is just an awesome pick. As soon as I saw that, I knew that this one would be on there. Yeah, I could totally picture that. Tasha! <laughs> All right. 
So next up we have LA Gunk performing Save Your Love, and that is also from Metal Mouth and Metal Mouth. Now look, people, I don't know who Metal Mouth is, and I put him on here three times. Metal Mouth, Metal Mike, maybe we're in the zone with each other, but come on, LA Gun, Save Your Love. I can hear Phil Lewis doing this one, like especially like the chorus when, when Ace gets up a little bit higher. Oh, I can totally hear Phil Lewis on that one. Maybe kill him. So next up we have Mark Slaughter with his band Slaughter, and it's going to be them performing Crazy Crazy Nights. So I tried to save Metal Malk on this one because Slaughter did not exist in 1989, but I think everybody would be familiar with Mark Slaughter because he was in Vinnie Vincent Invasion, and because of that he's part of the Kiss family, so it all works. So I put Slaughter featuring Mark Slaughter, and Crazy Crazy Nights, oh yeah, that's a higher one. That would fit right in the register with Mark Slaughter, yes. So Tom is coming back on this list with Cinderella doing Dirty Living. Yeah, I mean, I could totally hear this one with the uh, with the raspy voice that Tom Kiefer has, you know, also the raspy voice that Peter Chris has. And if you think about where Cinderella was, uh, 88 into 90, they were getting more funkier and more bluesy, and I think they could do a killer rendition of the song. Next up, we have Wasp performing Love Gun, and that is from Tony Rod at Tony Rod. So Tony, Tony likes him some Wasp. Tony knows that I like Wasp. And come on, man. Actually, you know what? I think it was Bob Nash and maybe Kiss Man. They had come, both came up with Wasp, Almost Human. And I almost went for it. But come on. We all know that Blackie Lawless is like a closet Paul Stanley wannabe. When you listen to him live, a lot of his live talk on Live in the Raw sounds exactly like Paul Stanley. Sometimes he dresses like Paul Stanley, especially around that era. And when you think about the love gun, this dude had the, the uh, flame spark spewing cod piece. He said saw blades on his cock uh, or his cod <laughs> cod piece. Yeah, and so blades on his so uh, so love gun. This is right in line with something that this guy would be talking about. So two individuals put this one through. We have Badlands doing Black Diamond, and Richie Rich put this one through. Uh, he is at 1967 Rich. And we also have Jack Skellington and Don1313. So Richie and Don, these guys you guys know their kiss, man. And they know music. They're good dudes. Um, but yeah, so much has been going on lately with Badlands. And I could totally hear Ray Gillen doing that softer beginning and then busting out into that raspy uh, sound uh, into the heavier part. And you know what? This doesn't have to be exactly the way Kiss would do it. This could be a little bit more of the Badlands style, a little bit more bluesy maybe. Um, but yeah, it would be it'd be killer. With, with uh, Ray Gillen on there, you can't go wrong. And finally, we have Quiet Riot doing the classic rock and roll all night. And that was submitted by Kiss Man at Kiss Man. So, you know what? I wanted to write off Rock and Roll Night. I'm sick of Rock and Roll Night. Poison has done Rock and Roll Night. But you know what? I saw Quiet Riot, and I was like, oh, yes. When I think about Come On, Feel the Noise, and I feel of, like, the way Kevin DeBro sings, he could kill this. And, um, yeah, just, just kind of picture the way he would do it. He would knock it out of the park. It would be awesome. And it would be a nice way to end a killer set list of tunes. So let me know what you think. You can put some comments in there, some ones that we missed. If you think these are great choices, uh, let me know. If you think they're terrible, I really don't care. The contest is over. But you know what? We'll do something fun again. Glad that you guys all participated. Right now! Shut up! This is my list.